Yeah, so I'm working on um, both modeling and data analysis to understand assembly of ecological communities. <coughs> Um, and so one of the, the technical term is community assembly, which is the abundance and coexistence of species in a particular location. Um, and the reasons this is important to study are to anticipate the effects of environmental change. It's good to have a mechanistic understanding of how species are interacting, how those interactions might change with various types of environmental change. Um, and one of the things that you know, I do in my PhD is how this relates to elemental cycling that I was working at Las Nacion Costera, and they're really interested in the effects of fishing as well. Um, so these are the questions that I ended up addressing, um, which is my kind of broad general question is what is the relationship between the interactions between species and the way that species are arranged in space or time? And kind of the premise behind this is that it's a lot easier to observe how species are arranged in space and time than it is how species are interacting with each other. And so if you could use the arrangement in space and time as kind of a proxy for how species are interacting with each other, you could at least generate hypotheses um, and narrow down which interactions you have to study. Um, yeah, so I looked at the expected role of species interactions in the spatial structure of a multi-species rather than you know, previous studies have looked at you know, one or two species competing or eating each other, and, which is a lot easier. <laughs> and then how can, the spatial, yeah, how can the spatial structure be used to infer species interactions? And then I used a more theoretical approach to look at how environmental variability might affect the way that species are interacting with each other and how that might manifest. Um, so my data came from two sites, um, which you'll generously provided me with data. Um, I looked at a microbial time series off of Concepcion, and I looked at a kind of time and spatial series in central Chile, in Las Cruces. And what's interesting about both of these sites, I think, is that there is a strong environmental gradient. Um, so in Concepcion, the samples I had were from four depths through one year, 2011. And this site has, here you're looking at a plot of oxygen. Um, it has almost no oxygen at the deeper sites during the summer, um, but there's oxygen during the winter. Um, and that's really, it's called an oxygen minimum zone, and that seems to be one of the major drivers of the community, is this environmental gradient in depth, but also through the year. Um, yeah, so then at each site, I somebody else sequenced um, some microbial samples from the water, um, and then I matched them to the species um, and looked at the composition throughout the year. And then the central Chile site, it's an environmental gradient that's present throughout the year, which is, I'm looking at the intertidal area. So this is kind of the highest high tide, and then this is the lowest low tide, and so I'm looking at what happens in between. So these are species that are in the water most of the time, but not at the very low tides. These are species that are out of the water almost all year. Um, and kind of how this environmental gradient and exposure to heat and kind of desiccation or drying out affects the arrangement. And I had samples kind of taken sporadically, but it was very deeply sampled when they were. So 1998, 2000, then three, four, five, and 2010. And the other part of my project was a theoretical model for these species interactions. And here I return to doing fewer species. Um, but the theoretical model is basically looking at rate of change in the abundance of a species. And so first I have the individual growth of species. Then I modeled species interactions. And then I used random noise to model the effects of the environment on this species. And I, this part I was interested in how you know, different types of interactions between species might be easier or not as easy to detect um, using kind of covariance. I'm going to explain how I look at the species interaction. And this is a time series. Um, yeah. So just to show you what the data would look like from this, um, here's the motif that I'm showing you. This is with no random noise. So the species grow. This is species four, one of the predators. This 
3 is another predator that's not as good at consuming. Um, and then these are the two prey species. Um, and then when I add noise, you still have, on average, they go to equilibrium, but you get all of this movement around the equilibrium. And that's where I can look at covariance. Yeah. Um, and so I, I've been saying this, that I'm using covariance to look at interactions between species. And the way that works is I have either sites or times and different species throughout time or in space. And if species overlap, kind of randomly, then they don't have a lot of covariance. It doesn't seem like they're too dependent on each other. If they barely overlap at all, maybe they're usually excluding each other, and so they'll have a negative covariance. Um, and if they overlap a lot, then you they would have a positive covariance. Um, so that's basically what I'm looking at. I think it's easier to think about in space, but the same concept applies in time. Um, right, and so from that, I get a covariance matrix which is a species by species matrix. Um, and then I might construct a network again from these, I'll take kind of the darkest green, the ones with highest covariance, and say those are the true species interactions and the rest are just these. We can skip this one. So this we're looking at the microbial time series. Um, and so what I did is I, Constructed first, I just used covariance to construct a network, um, and I noticed that when I took out different samples or did things like that, the network structure would change completely. And so it was difficult, I thought, to have confidence in this technique of constructing the network. But one of the things I did was to separate out along this environmental gradient. So I just used the surface samples, which through, on average through the year has a lot of oxygen, but it, in the summer it can be kind of considered suboxic or not completely oxygen, um, and then I looked at just the oxic samples, which have enough oxygen for growth. Um, and I found that there are actually fewer links in the oxic samples than in the surface, and this applied for every depth level comparison to oxygen level. And so my hypothesis here is that actually, rather than showing species interactions, maybe these network constructions are more driven by environment links because of environmental preferences rather than actual interactions. Um, and, a really, and a really cool thing about the last Tuesday site is that they've actually completely constructed interactions between species um, using experiments, using kind of natural history explorations, using isotope data. Um, so they know pretty comprehensively how species are interacting in central Chile in the intertidal zone. And so that allowed me to test these hypotheses, which maybe don't apply completely because it's microbial versus um, intertidal animals. Um, but I could say, so I know what the interactions are, how does that relate to the covariance? Um, and so I'm gonna focus on this positive non-trophic for the slideshow, mostly because it's easier to see because there are fewer links. Um, but a positive non-trophic interaction is something like facilitation where one species will provide habitat for another. Um, it can also be shelter from predation. Um, and in the intertidal, seaweed might keep water in that other species can then hide in the seaweed so they don't dry out at low tide and things like that. Um, yeah, so just to explain, what I'm gonna show in the next is I take these same links and these same species and now I'm gonna color them based on whether they were detected in co-occurrence or not. So now I've labeled the species. Um, if there's a blue <coughs> link, that means that it was detected in, it was detected as positive covariance. A red link is that it was negative covariance. And then a white link is that it wasn't detected as covariance. Um, and so for the positive non-trophic interactions, actually about 70% were detected um, using covariance. But a few of them were detected as negative covariance. Um, and so, yeah, and so I have a number of hypotheses for why I think positive relationships were fairly easy to detect. Um, and then uh, also some hypotheses about why some of these negative links showed up. Um, and so this one's related to what I was discussing with the microbes. So there's um, this snail, Ascura, um, which uses both 
both of these two texts of seaweed, um, El Negrenses, which is also El Lissoneus Picada, um, and this M. Lamariodis as shelter. Um, it could theoretically use either. Um, but you notice that both of these prefer the low intertidal, um, whereas this other seaweed prefers the mid intertidal. And so I think the reason that there's a negative covariance here is just because of habitat preference. So even though there's a positive link between species, and covariance was detected between these two species, it wasn't detected because they were interacting at all, I think. It was actually because they weren't interacting just because of environment, not because of the character, biotic characteristics. Um, but that's not the only thing that's going on here. Um, for example, one of the interesting things about this data set is there are, so there are about 98 species, and with that, they could be really complex interactions. Um, for example, this snail, a castere, has a negative interaction with P. pergamus, which is a mussels, even though they theoretically have a positive non-trophic interaction. Um, so this, this crab can take refuge in either the seaweed or in the mussel beds. Um, and these are, they're, these are both very well connected because they're kind of the two different ecosystem states. You could either have a lot of seaweed or a lot of mussels. Um, depending on what's going on. But I think that this negative interaction here is because this crab maybe prefers the seaweed, but these are two completely different ecosystem states, and there's actually a very strong negative interaction between these two species um, as one of the negative non-trophic interactions. And so even though this, so this is what I would call an indirect interaction, that even though this Snail may be interacting weakly, positively with these two. There's an overwhelming indirect negative interaction that this seaweed is actually excluding the muscle. Um, yeah, so just kind of anecdotes about what I think is going on in this one. Um, and a summary, which I think goes back to this point about the effects of the environment. So I said, I, I, when I use all of the samples, I can detect about 77% of the non-trophic positive interactions, which is really high. Um, but when I divide by environmental conditions, so this is high intertidal, mid intertidal, and low intertidal, I get significantly lower percentage of interactions, um, which to me indicates that it is the environmental gradient that's allowing you to detect a lot of these interactions rather than the species interactions themselves, um, which is what I thought was going on with the microbes as well. Yeah. And then I'm going to go briefly back to the theoretical model. So remember, now I'm looking at covariance within a time series. Um, yeah, so these results get a little bit complicated. But what you're looking at here is interaction strength. Um, so that's how, what are the rates of biomass transfer, energy transfer along these links. And then here, this is the magnitude of random noise which going back is kind of how, why, how big these excursions are from the media, or from the media state. And so a motif like this, which is very, fairly simple, there's one species that preys on three others. I found you have a low probability of detecting it, but you have a non-random probability of detecting it, and you can detect it across a wide range of parameter space. So this is, you detect about 11% of the time, or as interactions get stronger, about 14% of the time. Um, yeah, and so what I, the color tells you which network you're detecting. But then something like this, and I call these kind of linear type networks, um, where if you were to unravel it, it would be a line. They're almost never detected. I never detect a linear network either as a true linear network or constructed falsely as something that didn't exist. Instead, it's constructing the, it's constructing the same network, this kind of star shaped with species four in the center, and species four is still my top predator, but it's missing that it's not connected to species one directly. Um, or these kind of triangle with one species left out completely. Um, and I thought that one was particularly interesting, especially when you look at this one. Um, so this top number means that I had a 61% chance of detecting this module. And so that's not the module that 
is related to how the species are interacting with each other, but it's a really high probability of detecting something. So it's, a not, it's constructing something non-random, but it's constructing something that's wrong, um, which I think is interesting and important to point out that we're actually, when you construct networks using covariance, you might not actually, you're going to construct something, but it might not be what you have. Um, and so I was actually able to prove, or to demonstrate that this is related to transient phenomena. The witch species is, goes farther away from equilibrium, and that's species three in this model. That it gets sent really far away from equilibrium when I have noise. And so it's related to transients and not to the equilibrium species in the direction. So just showing my conclusions. From the empirical data, um, I've been suggesting that environmental tolerance may actually be more important than biotic interactions um, for co-occurrence and covariance of species. Um, and that the ecology may limit the number of realized interactions. So this isn't something I showed since I was focusing on the more sparse positive interactions, but with those really dense networks, I just think there's a limit to how many interactions you can actually detect between species. Um, and then look at the theory. Um, it, you would expect as I add more noise that you would decrease the ability to detect species interaction, but I found that wasn't actually true. Um, that as you add noise, you're just as likely to detect covariance in the time series. Um, and that the covariance metric seems to be biased against detecting chain geometries, um, or these linear geometries, but may converge on other types of geometries. Again, a lot of acknowledgments um, to the various groups that posted here.
how would you how would you figure out? In a microbial yeah. community? Then that's a problem. So a lot of these species we don't have in the lab because they're hard to grow. Um, yeah. I mean, I have some ideas, like looking at you know, covariance with environment incorporated into these networks, incorporated into how you analyze the data, separating out variants into which part of the variance is related to the environment and which part is related to species interactions. But yeah. 